Good morning, my Good morning. Good morning. We're going to get started with some announcements today. So we do believe tonight at 6 o'clock, the food bank in Bethlehem uh, is open this Tuesday from 12 to 4. And volunteers are always needed. Uh, Bible study will be this week, this Wednesday at 6 o'clock p.m. Um, in the covered dish and the Bible study will follow. Uh, we'll be honoring high school and college grads on May 23rd. Any names of the graduates? Uh, see Dub. Worship night is next Wednesday, so feel free to come on out for that or tune in online. And the fellowship meeting is today after church. I'm going to read you from Psalm 9. Board meeting tomorrow. Board meeting tomorrow. tomorrow at 6. The board meeting is tomorrow at 6. There you go. Good? Okay. Uh, Psalm 9 this morning uh, says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad to rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. So let's sing some praise in his name. All right, let's stand together and worship the Lord.
to say a blessing, please.
My 
And yesterday we looked out the back window of our house and we watched a baby fawn be born. And uh, that was just really neat to see that and to see the mother keep coming out to feed it and all. And it's just, uh, God's given us a beautiful country, a beautiful life. And I thank him for life. Amen. Yes, Ellen. He scored a goal yesterday in soccer, yeah? Yes. John and Melissa have been together 35 years old tomorrow. 35 years. <laughs> and I believe Sean and Misty have a, today is their anniversary. That's, uh, they had some special plans this morning. But, uh, uh, so 35 years, John and Melissa and Sean and Misty. And also, I don't know how many years they have. Less than 35 and more than 14. So, so <laughs> they're, they're somewhere in between. Yes, Fred. Nice to see Larry back, yes. Yes, Pam. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I want to thank the Lord for prayer. And people can say it instead of letting me read the Bible in the church. And it's important. I mean, I, I was doing all those things, but I still was missing it. I mean, I, and today, just singing these songs and stuff brings tears to my eyes because I miss it. And I thank you all for praying for me. And I thank God for keeping me healthy enough that I can do the things that I do. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Amen. How about the prayer requests? Um, not one call in this morning from uh, Bonnie Root. Um, she lost uh, her brother this week and also lost a, a sister the last couple of months. And uh, so she was asking prayer for her family and especially for her mother who's going through a really difficult time uh, with the loss of uh, uh, a son and also for the, the family of the minor that was, that was killed this week. Um, so remember uh, that family as well and co-workers. Anybody else have a prayer this morning? Yes, Our Jordan Crane, his aunt passed away on Monday. She said that this day is that on the nephew passed away from the Okay, so Jordan's aunt and the nephew. Jordan's aunt and the nephew. Yes, Debbie. Um, on Monday, Jerry had good results on the one test. And I don't want to read it wrong, but one was whether he still um, vision was still a problem. Okay. Roger. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody with an unspoken request, you can just lift up a hand. Right, before we take these to the, the Lord in prayer, let's uh, worship together.
for birthdays. And Lord, we thank you for, for the message of John 3.16 and how you sent your son to save us. Lord, we, we thank you for new nephews and for anniversaries uh, this week uh, with three of them in the church. And uh, Lord, we thank you for safe travel and, uh, and, and, and Lord, for uh, Ellen scoring a goal in soccer. And, and Lord, uh, for Larry being here, and, and, and Lord, that we just thank you uh, for, for all of these things. And, and, and Lord, we just want to lift up those who are hurting. And Lord, we think of, of Bonnie Ruth and, and her mother and her family as they're uh, going through the loss of, of uh, a brother and a son. And after they, so soon after they lost a, a sister and a daughter, Lord, we just pray for this family, Lord, that you would, would lift them up, Lord, and you would... Uh, uh, just uh, hold them close to you, and Lord, just uh, uh, allow your love to, to wash over them and your peace during this time. Lord, we also think of this, the, the, the minor that was in the accident, and we think of his, his family and his co-workers, Lord, and we, we're just asking for your mercy to, to be on them, and, and Lord, we're, we're just uh, praying and hoping, Lord, for, for, for your uh, presence to be around them as they go through this such a difficult time, and Lord, we, we think of George, who had an aunt and nephew pass away uh, this week, and uh, Lord, we just ask for, for prayers for their uh, family, for, for comfort and, and healing, Lord, and, and Lord, we thank you for Jerry getting good results, but Lord, he's still uh, uh, lacking in uh, being able to see on this, this eye, and Lord, we're, we're praying for a touch from you, uh, Lord, to restore this vision, and and Lord, to do it soon, and and even beginning now, Lord, that in your power, you begin to restore his sight. And Lord, we just lift up Roger Carrier to you, and Lord, we're we're just asking uh, uh, for your prayers of, of of healing upon his body right now. And Lord, uh, for the church building and, and the site, uh, Lord, we're, we thank thank you for what we see uh, being done over there. And and Lord, for uh, the Bob who uh, had a kidney transplant this week, we pray for for healing and success in the operation. Uh, and Lord, for Bob Stallman, we pray for him, that you would strengthen him and help him to be able to eat. And, and, and Lord, for uh, the prayer for wisdom, uh, Father God, for the near future, Lord, we, we just lift that up to you. And Lord, just ask that you would grant that you said to, that when we ask for wisdom, that, that we will receive it. And so, Lord, we just uh, we are asking, and, and Lord, uh, for every hand that was raised for an unspoken request, Lord, we pray that you would, would meet these needs and be with them in a mighty way. And Lord, as we come to you uh, um, for the, the sermon and, and as we go into your word, Lord, I, I'm praying for revelation. I'm praying for insight from the Holy Spirit. And Lord, for uh, to change us to become more like you, uh, Father God, in the area of love. And so, Lord, we just thank you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, children are dismissed for Children's Church.
a person who should be showing the world what love and marriage is all about has broken his vows and done irreparable damage to those whom he should be loving. And as I read something like this, it makes one thing clear. We don't know what love is. We don't know what love is. Not even a little bit, or even worse, we take love and we cheapen it to mean something even less than what it's supposed to, to, to mean. And you've probably seen the signs, after all, love is love, right? They're up everywhere. Love is love. Well, you can make that mean just about anything that you want it to mean. There are all kinds of people, all kinds of groups, all kinds of pastors, all kinds of Christians claiming that love is love. And they're okay with that. But can I let you in on a little secret? God does not need us to redefine love. God is not okay with you redefining love however you want to make it fit into your little boxes. After all, here are just a few things God has said about love from his scripture. Let's look at John 15, 9 through 17. It says, as the Father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Who does love belong to? Belongs to the Father. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, my father will give you. This is my command, love each other. So we can get all willy-nilly with what love means, right? It gets better. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages... He might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself. It's a free gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And one more, 1 John 4, 7 through 12. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Pay attention to this. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So, as I read these three passages of Scripture here, 
These things become clear in my head. Number one, God is the only one who can define love because he showed us love in the first place. God is the only one who can define love because he showed us love in the first place. Even when we were far from him, he loved us. Even when we were far from him, he said, I will send my son to die for you. God is the only one who can define love. Number two, love should always cost us something. Because the example is, when God gave up His Son, Jesus Christ, the example that we're to follow is that we give up something for those that we love. And thirdly, love always shows itself by how we act and not just by what we say. Amen. If you think love is about feelings, you are mistaken. There is a love that is about feelings, but it's not the one that God has defined. Love is about action and not about feeling. You know, we've been talking for the last few weeks about faith, hope, and love. Because these are the three things that Paul told us. They will remain. They will, they will stick around. They will, they will, they will uh, pass the test of time. But of these three things, Paul makes this statement. Now these three were made, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so this morning and next week, uh, quite possibly, I want to take a look at the greatest of these is love. Because this one we need to get down above all other things. And I think that there's a, a one passage of scripture in Romans 12, Romans 12 that puts this kind of God's love into the most practical terms for our day and age and what it looks like in our life. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn or you can follow along on the screen to Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 9. I don't know how far we're going to get today, but we're going to see where we get. We're going to start in verse 9 and, uh, and read to verse 21 and we'll see how far we get the uh, in the meantime, but Romans chapter 12, verse 9, it says this, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's just a few short verses, but there is a lifetime worth of information in this passage. And, and so I want to just take a, take a look at the greatest force on this earth that is available to us. The love of God. The love of God coming from God to us, and then the love of God in us flowing out to the people around us. But before we take a closer look, let's ask the Lord to, to bless our time together. And Larry, can I ask you to bless our time together this morning? Holy Father, thank you for the name of Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit. Lord, I do, I thank you for this privilege. Thank you. 
to just hear these words of the Lord, but to start practicing and put them to use in the Lord. And we give you all the honor, glory, and praise. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, right off the bat in this scripture, we're hit with this phrase. It says, Love must be sincere. Now, if you have another translation, this is the NIV. If you have another translation, yours might say, Love must be genuine. Or the King James, Love must be, anybody know? Unfeigned. No, it's not in our regular vocab anymore. Love must be unfeigned. And so, do you know what the Greek word literally means that is translated as genuine, sincere, or unfeigned? It literally means to not act like a hypocrite. Or to not act like a phony. You see, right from the get-go, this has nothing to do with what I feel. This has nothing to do with my emotions. This has everything to do with how I act. True love is about action. Genuine love is about action. Sincere love is about action. It means that we have a real love that's not just saying, I love you. It's showing people that I love you. It's not just saying, oh, I feel like I love you this morning. But it's showing you, I love you this morning. It's a person that backs up their words and their feelings with real action. Isn't it easy to tell people that you love them? We just shorten it. Love you. Anybody have that? Love you. That's easy. But what sincere love is, is much more harder to prove because it is proven through your actions. A person with sincere love will spend their lifetime proving that they love their God, that they love their spouse, that they love their children, that they love their neighbor, that they love their co-workers, and that they even love their enemies. There's not really anyone outside of the love that we're supposed to show. And thankfully, the writer of, of, of this passage lays out some really practical ways that you can show sincere love to the people that are in your life. And you can prove that your love is genuine. So this is where they start. It says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, and cling to what is good. So here's where we start. God made everything on this earth and he said it was good. So this included, if we go back to Genesis, this includes making male and female and setting up marriage as a lifelong time commitment between a husband and wife. This is what God said was good. So we need to hate everything outside of this goodness. And we need to love everything inside of it. In other words, anything outside of what God describes as good cannot be defined as love. Period. That's a hard thing. Love is only love when it's inside the confines of what God created to be good. We don't get to define what love is. God has already done that. So any relationship that's outside of his plan, his good plan, is not and cannot be love. Period. But here's the rub. We don't get to hate people. We hate the evil, but we're commanded to love every person. To love our enemies, to love our co-workers. And how many of you got some really... Whacked out co-workers. How many of you have some really whacked out neighbors? How many of you got some really whacked out family members? (laughs) 
unless it's inside of what God has defined as good, it cannot be given the label of sincere love. And so we need to find the place where we can still love the people that are outside of the good and still let them know that they're not living in truth and in love. This involves people who are living a homosexual lifestyle. But it also involves a, a heterosexual lifestyle that is not confined in marriage. We can't pick and choose. God made everything on this earth and said it was good. We need to push toward the good. Because that's where love is. Love is in goodness. Share the truth in love. Share the truth in love. Hating what is evil and clinging to what is good is what love is about. Here's the next one. Be devoted to one another in love. Actual love has a component of devotion to it. And let me tell you that Christians should have the best marriages of anyone on this earth. There shouldn't even be a close second because we know what true love is or we say that we know what true love is. Being devoted to one another is, is sincere love. And so this is a commitment to stay true through thick and thin, not to leave your wife for your own desires. Hello? But all couples make these commitments through vows at their wedding, and real love will keep these commitments through richer or poorer. You remember these lines? Through sickness and in hell? Through better or for worse? We remember those? Some people have to take that longer than others. <laughs> Fake love only sticks around when it's convenient. Sincere love, it's devoted to one another. It's committed to one another. It stands the test of time. Be devoted to one another. The third thing, honor one another above yourself. True love, sincere love, honors one another above yourself. And when you love someone, you will not feel threatened when they achieve something greater, when they deserve praise. But yet, how many times do we see someone and say, well, why did they get that? That's what I wanted. When you have this sincere love, you always seek to lift people up and not tear them down. Hypocritical love will say congrats to your face while tearing you down with words behind your back. It will result in jealousy and selfishness, but genuine love seeks to honor others above ourselves. And this will look a lot like encouragement. And it will also look like you having to humble yourself on a daily basis, or maybe hourly basis, or maybe a minute-by-minute -minute basis. But sincere love honors one another above ourselves. Number four, we'll keep going here. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So if God is love and all true love resides in God, you cannot truly love God or anyone else unless you stay connected to God. People who truly have God's love in their lives, they'll want to go to church. Did you hear me? People who truly have God's love in their lives will want to go to church. They will want to serve God. They will want to serve others. They'll want to be around other church people because that's their group. That's where they find love. It won't be a chore for them. It will become their very nature. If you don't like the things of the Lord, you're not in His love. 
nor can you show his love. But when you are in his sincere love, in his genuine love, you will love the thing that the Lord loves. And you will desire the thing that the Lord loves. And you will want to give this love out to as many people as possible. You will serve and keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and fervent in prayer. When I get busy, I'm going to make this confession. The first thing to go is the prayer. I got this, Lord. Just, just Lord, let me go and let me take this. I, I, I got it. We, you know, we, what, what did we say in Sunday school, Heather? I don't need your help. Don't you see? I'm busy down here. Busy solving all the problems. But if you hold on to love, sincere love, you will be fervent in prayer. You'll be joyful because of the hope that is in you. You'll be patient in affliction. You won't be tossed by every hardship that comes your way because you know the one who has the way out. And you have a lifeline to him in prayer. When things get hard, you, you'll seek the source of all love and prayer and you'll get charged up to face whatever comes next. We'd have to stop listening to that voice that tells you you don't have time for prayer today. <laughs> That's not a good voice. When you love the Lord, prayer will be desired in your natural language. You'll just cry out to Him. And you'll believe that He can help in all things. Let's get two more here this morning. Sharing with those in need. Sharing with those in need. It says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. True love is a selfish love, and when you're filled with the real and genuine love of God, you can't help but give of what you have. When you see a need, you fill it. I think the best example of this is like a mom who makes sure that her kids have everything that they need to survive. You'll look at your fellow man and say, you have everything that you need. How can I help you? What do you, I need to give you to help you survive? When you have the love of God, your money is always free to help the needy. It's like the pen in, that writes the checks gets freed up. When you have the love of God in you, when you see a need, you fill it. And also it tells us just a little, a, a few words later. Practice hospitality. If you have the love of God in you, you can't help but be generous with that love. Because you know God has given you every good thing that you have. You're quick to share things, even homes, even your home with people. And the people of God, filled with his love, treat their home as if it has an open door, an open seat, and an open ear for you anytime. People are not a burden. Did you, did you get that? People are not a burden. They are a blessing. And they are welcome and should be welcome in our home and in our lives. And we need to practice hospitality with them. I'm going to stop right there for this morning. We're going to pick up the second part of this verse next time. It doesn't get any easier, I'm just going to tell you. But we have so cheapened love and made it to be what we want it to be throughout our lives. We can't settle for what is called this hypocritical love. We are called to a sincere, genuine love. We've been given the real thing by a real God who defined love for us. 
And we have to give that out to everyone, to the sinner. We show them godly love and we tell them the truth in love from Scripture. And we watch them still sin because they are a sinner. And we don't hold it against them and we show them love again and tell them the truth. To the brother or sister in Christ, we lift them up and encourage them even when they've made a mistake, even when they fall. To our spouse, we live out our, veil, our vows. We selflessly champion them in their lives until the day that we die. To our enemies, we'll find out next week what we have to do with that. God's love will be the only thing that matters and will be the only thing that will remain above all these other things. If you're still confused as what that means for you, let's take a look at this video. So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in day to day was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is Aramaic, in which the word for love is rahma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek, using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus, who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, there are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people, and vice versa, they're inseparable. So this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them, expecting nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy-embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this, while we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only Son into the world 
so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, Beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world. Which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others. Creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. So if you want the sermon and the video summed up in two words, here it is. Love does. Love does. Love is an action, and love is a verb, and if your actions don't back up your words, you're not living up to the standard of love that you've been given yourself. Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, or God's enemies, Christ died for us. He gave his life for us. So unless your actions... Back up your talk about love. What you have is not love. It's an imposter. And so let's ask ourselves this question. Do I have this agape love inside of me? And what can I point to and say, and this action is the proof. And this action is the proof. And this action is the proof. It will be easy to find if you have this inside you, because it will naturally flow out of you in good deeds toward your fellow man. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your agape love. The unconditional love that you showed us by sending your son Jesus to die in our place, to give us forgiveness of sin, and to offer us grace. And Lord, as we accept that grace and accept that love, may we be quick to show that love to all those who are around us. Heavenly Father, show us that love is not a feeling. That love is much more than words, but Lord, that love is action. Sincere and genuine love is action. Father God, if there is anyone who is here today who has never experienced your love, Lord, may they do that today. And Lord, may they realize that they will never be able to love someone truly until they have given you their lives fully and surrender to your love. Lord, forgive us for any time that we've ever cheapened your love by trying to redefine it or make it to be what we want it to be. And Lord, help us to live in this kind of love as we go out into a world that is completely bereft of it, has no sign of love in it. Lord, we just ask your Holy Spirit to move and to work today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Anybody who would like a prayer this morning as the worship team closes with a song, you can uh, come up and we'll pray over you. If anybody has, who is here who has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, let me tell you, you don't even know what love is. Anyone who would just like to spend time with him may come and, and pray at the altar as we close with this song. Let's stand together.
for sale. It's only part of the way, going part of the way to becoming a Christian. We have to take it and give it out to those who need to hear it. Sincere love will we'll tell other people and will show other people that you love them. They won't be able to argue with God's love. They might be able to shout you down. They might be able to say, yeah, not right now. They might, but they can't run from the love of God forever. Give them the love of God in a sincere and genuine manner through your actions. Find somebody and love them like God loved you this week. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful Sunday.